The view from Phil Hogan's home in the hills of Black Hawk, South Dakota, is commanding. His career has taken him from the hills and prairies of South Dakota to the halls of Washington, D.C., and back again. Phil retired in 2009 from a life of public service. Went to law school in South Dakota and went to Kennebec, South Dakota, to practice law. That happened to be the hometown of Jim Abner. And uh, while I was learning how to practice law, representing Lower Brule and Crow Creek tribes there along the Missouri River, uh, Jim Abner, who was the lieutenant governor, uh, ran for Congress. And uh, as the local kid lawyer, I helped campaign, and he was elected. Uh, so he asked me to be his chief of staff. Then Jim Abner in 1980 was elected uh, to the United States Senate. President Reagan was elected. South Dakota needed a U.S. attorney. I had Jim Abner's support and I was appointed uh, to be the U.S. attorney for South Dakota, which may be the best job I ever had, and uh, served in that capacity for 10 years, from 1981 to 1991. It was around this time when the Cabazon decision was about to be rendered by the U.S. Supreme Court. And there was talk about legislation on Capitol Hill regarding Indian gaming. The chair of our committee was Jim Rosenbaum from Minnesota. Uh, Jim is a great lawyer. Uh, I don't know that he knows that much about Indians, but he learned. And uh, uh, the knee-jerk reaction in the Justice Department, I believe at the time, was, hey, that's gambling. Well, that's not good. We're going to be against that. But we were talking about it in our subcommittee. And I said to Jim Rosenbaum, you know, Jim, tribes have really got it tough these days. They need more economic development opportunity, and gambling might work. And Jim, who's Jewish by heritage and identifies with persecuted minorities and has strong feelings, uh, picked up on that. And together, we then, the subcommittee, I think kind of turned the Justice Department in the right way with respect to supporting the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. and. Uh, uh, it's been a great blessing for Indian country uh, in, in so many ways. One of the first things you notice in a lot of Indian communities is they walk with a little more spring in their step and a sparkle in their eye uh, because now in their communities the tribes are somebody. They're important economic players. Uh, and uh, you look around the neighborhoods and you see clinics, you see schools, uh, you see economic opportunity that didn't exist before those gaming revenues came along. In many places, like Pine Ridge, the main thing it does, it doesn't make millions of dollars to be distributed, it gives jobs to people that didn't have jobs before. Well, yeah, we, when, when we As a member of the Oglala Nation, Phil did a great deal of explaining and educating his colleagues in D.C. about Native issues and federal Indian law. Phil served as the first director of the Office of American Indian Trust. He capped his career of public service by being the longest serving chairman of the National Indian Gaming Commission. When I left the U.S. Attorney's Office in 1991, uh, I was appointed by Secretary Emanuel Lujan to serve as the first director of the Office of American Indian Trust. Uh, that office had not been going before, so we organized that. The mission or one of the missions of that office was to in effect sensitize the whole Department of the Interior to the federal trust responsibility and then beyond just the Department of the Interior but all of the federal agencies that work with tribes to, to kind of turn that up and of course to raise an awareness uh, you know about where there were failures in terms of looking after the trust assets uh, for the, the, the tribal members. Then I got a call from the Clinton administration. Uh, Secretary Babbitt needed to appoint uh, a Republican member of the National Indian Gaming Commission. They were looking for an Indian Republican uh, former prosecutor, and that was kind of a short list. And so I, that sounded like a good job, so I, I took it, and it was a real, uh, uh, you know, I had the opportunity on the Indian Affairs Subcommittee and now on the commission to have a front row seat with respect to the, you know, the getting off the ground of the great Indian gaming industry. The regulation of legalized gambling is basically a three-legged stool. You have to first of all look at the backgrounds of the people that are involved, that you license to work casino. You only want decent people doing that. Uh, then you have to make sure that the rules are fair and square. Fair to the casino, fair to the bingo hall, fair to the players, and that they aren't cheating one another. 
uh, and then you have to follow the money. You have to very carefully track those proceeds from the time they go in the slot machine or uh, blackjack table uh, till they are eventually distributed. And I've read the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, and I swore to uphold it as well as the United States Constitution. It's not a perfect document by any means, but it says there will be federal uh, oversight, there will be tribal regulation, and we wanted to make sure that that rail was in place to give the firm foundation that tribal gaming needed. And if for some reason there's a problem, there's somebody to call. They can talk to the tribe, of course. If there's a compact, they can talk to the state. But NIGC is going to be there as well and, and try to provide that assurance, and I think it does.